yeah, just be like I'm Frankie. No story behind it, just... They ask me what's your full name, I would say it's Frankie Sawyer Adroff. It was four o'clock in the morning and I woke up with a backache and I knew this was going to be the day that she was going to be born. Basically, two hours from being admitted, she was born. She was perfect. When she was four months old, though, I noticed when I was giving her a bath that she had a dark spot, um, like a birthmark that's dark, but it covered her entire back. Just around the time she was turning three, we got a call from Dennis's sister, and her son had been diagnosed with neural fibromatosis. And she talked about these coffee-colored birthmarks. So I lifted up her shirt and I said, you mean like this? And she was horrified by what she, she said, not that bad, but those are exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, we came to realize that this is one of the worst cases in the world that they had come across. Neurofibromatosis disrupts cell growth in the nervous system, causing tumors to form on nerve tissue. Janice has tumors on her spine, which will likely leave her paralyzed. Nurse said, after she has her CT scan, she's going to be admitted. She's going upstairs. They're going to do surgery tomorrow. So the surgeon came out. He said, you know, we need to get her into a body brace. She had a brace given to her by the Variety Show Hearts. And getting that, she wanted to pay back. So she started a coin drive at the age of six. So she would go to class to class every morning with this little jar of pennies and we'd have it on the announcements and assemblies. Ice cream buckets with the little notches cut out of the top, going around all the classrooms. Some days she wouldn't get anything, and other days she'd get quite a lot. She raised $164 the first year. Didn't think that was enough. She was saying, now how do I reach more people? And I pointed to the TV and I said, right there. She wanted to raise obviously more than $160 and she came to check, so we decided to publicize her coin drive. By raising money for Variety, the children's charity, the Edrafts say Janice is able to keep her mind away from the excruciating pain. This little girl has made, you know, touched so many people's hearts that they care back. Check, I think, realized their ratings in that three-week period just skyrocketed and they thought they've got a really good thing going here. Uh, we've got to do it again next year. Sometimes it was uh, grandmothers with, with coins that they've been collecting, sometimes with grandchildren. You would see the posters in businesses and that sort of thing. And then you knew it was bigger than the school. It just kept going forward and forward and getting bigger. And It was a real story. Real stories of real people are always the most compelling. Here's a kid with a terrible condition that has seen her go through, what, I don't know, a score or more of surgeries. Yeah, what does she do with it? She turns it on its head and goes, here I am, Victoria, let's hop on board and fight this thing. And we wrote dozens of stories about Janice. Somebody asked her, one of the reporters, how much does she want to raise? Like one million dollars. No, she was like, that's a lot of money. I was like, pennies, nobody's gonna, you're not gonna make a million dollars, like that's not happening. Certainly the adults, like our parents, thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it, a million dollars in pennies, that's a hundred million pennies. Like, we looked at each other and she hasn't got a clue, you know. But she did in some ways. She knew what she wanted. We have been getting calls all day on this story. People we all know the story of Janice Androff. People barely took any time at all after Czech News announced a fundraising drive for donations to start pouring in. And the pennies, nickels and dimes she's collecting aren't for her. To reach a fundraising Hour away from a very special, what we like to think of as a Vancouver Island superstar. And the coins are still coming in. Just how much Janice Androff has touched them. It's been crazy. <laughs> I have worked here for over a year and I've never seen this many people come into this station. <laughs> Every single one of them has been for Janice. The, the response from viewers was unbelievable. The, the lobby of the, of the television station was, was literally full of pennies and buckets and cans and uh, water jugs and any, anything people could put pennies in. And then there was 
going, how are we going to roll this all and how are we going to get it counted for the telethon? You got BC Transit involved because, of course, they have coin counters. They showed up one day outside the station with a, with a transit bus. You got a rugby team, I think, to, to bring all the coins down to BC Transit. They loaded up one bus full. They almost lost the hydraulics on the bus. They had to replace the floor in the bus. Eventually, we started learning that uh, you've got to wear gloves when you're doing this, not for just health reasons, but the copper. I ended up getting the shakes. Too much you copper in my system. It became to the point where we had so much copper in our building that we had to be careful. We had electricians tell us that there was a potential that we could cause an arcing of our electrical system. The fire department asked them to move it because they were afraid of losing the floor. <laughs> The most grassroots level fundraiser I've ever seen. I don't know if there's been anything ever quite like it on Vancouver Island or, or maybe even anywhere. Where will Janice go from here? Well, she's telling friends her next goal is building a Ronald McDonald house here on Vancouver Island. I'm Frankie and a ambitious, crazy, love for life, um, live every life to the moment of greatness, um, guy, keyword, guy. Yesterday, I went to a doctor who specializes in transition on um, Fairfield. And so I had my first appointment, which is just going to know the patient. And then I have two more appointments, which are a physical and then sign all the paperwork. And by September 10th, unless they have a cancellation, I will be starting testosterone on that day. So with NF, when you put hormones into the body or you're going through puberty, it affects the growth of tumors and all the lesions and stuff. So, um, like the tumors inside, or even these little marks that have, like, I have little red dots and these things, they grow with puberty and the hormones. And so, putting hormones in your body can affect that. And, like, yes, I understand that risk, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm happy. And as long as I'm happy doing what I'm supposed to do, then that's good. Because no matter what, my disease is gonna kill me. So whether I do, I'm living it the way I want to or not. But like I said to my parents, I'm like, I'd rather be happy and become who I want to be and have my life shown that way than me showing my life by doing something stupid. Yeah, like I was very like, nervous about the whole thing because I knew that his doctors had told him that it wasn't probably the best idea to do so. So I was definitely very nervous. There was definitely a lot of conversations of, well, maybe you shouldn't. In the end, it has been a positive thing and that hasn't actually had any effects negatively. It definitely he's still depressed. Like, but I mean, I think you would probably have a lot of depression based on having all these medical issues and being in the hospital all the time. Like it's a pretty sad situation. Mm -hmm. I think behind the scenes, Frankie may have been struggling. She was on her own in high school. It was re really difficult for her in high school because she didn't have a lot of close friends to rely on because she was not there enough. I think a lot of people start looking at it as, oh, you're crying wolf, there's nothing really wrong with you because they can't see it. It's an invisible problem. Some of her teachers were a little bit insensitive to her medical needs too, and I think that didn't help. So they were always trying to protect her with some kind of device, and I think that just pointed her out to other kids and isolated her from people, and it, it didn't work. She was bullied quite a bit because of all this, partly because she was famous. Uh, I don't know if that's jealousy or, or what it is, but um, it made her life at school very, very tough. There was a lot very personal, very private conversations. She needed to talk to someone. I don't think her parents knew at that time. She was afraid if it got out to the public that she would lose her fundraising corporations 
and she told me she was gay. She said, well, I knew, but I couldn't tell anyone. And that, that was hard on her. So she did, she did need to talk about it. I was one of the first people that he talked to about it. One thing he was really sad about was not finding anyone to date. So he was kind of lonely. Yeah, we spent a lot of time in his car at Copley Park, staring out at the field and talking about things like that. Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about it. So I have a reporter that's going to be calling me for an interview. So I'm just waiting for a phone call. And phone call. <laughs> What's the prognosis for this tumor? You said it's on your pancreas, is it's that right? beside my pancreas, and I don't know the prognosis or anything about it too much. Um, they don't want to do surgery here. So I was, I wanted to ask before I ask any questions, what do you most want to talk about? What do you most want people to know? The things I want them to know is that I'm still the same person as people who grew up to know me as. But yep. I'm just going by a different sex and a different name and... Kind of feel like you're, you're home now in your body? Yeah, I'm more myself. I feel more like I'm not trapped. Yeah. And like I'm hiding something from the world or like it had to be some big secret. How was your transition going from being a relatively high public figure to, you know, the person in the pet store. It gives me the break of not being in the public eye and having a camera in my face 24-7. Yeah, at the time even, did you ever want out? Like, I know you didn't want to drop your cause, but... My dad it was overwhelming at times, yeah. Yeah. But... I always thought, no, I have to finish my projects. Like, I'm one who has to finish something. Because fundraising was a distraction to take away the pain. It was a good distraction for everything. 16-year-old Janice Edroff received an early Christmas present today, a toy excavator, symbolizing that shovels will soon go into the ground as her dream becomes reality. Of course, living on Vancouver Island, every time you have to go to Children's Hospital, it's either a flight or a two and a half hour ferry ride. Janice sees that I'm frantically on the phone trying to find a location for us to spend the night. You know, average stay is like 38 days. 38 days in a hotel, not gonna happen. And that's when she said, I really want to build a place that can help parents and help the kids. And we said, that's, that's a very noble idea. What can we do to help? And they said, build the house. So that's your dream, I said, well, why don't we do it? <laughs> she said, that would be good. <laughs> I said, no, let's do it. Well, one, one day, uh, Bruce Williams wants to have coffee with me. And when Bruce Williams wants to have coffee with, with you, it means he wants something. <laughs> yeah. And so we had a meeting with the Children's Health Foundation at the time. We're very nervous. And can we raise that kind of money? Not realizing what Janice could achieve. In 2006, the total was $59,000. And in 2007, $96,317. And the totals have risen every year since. Janice has raised millions of dollars to help sick children. But she didn't stop there. Here's this kid, right? And she's determined, brave, inspiring. She really created a following for uh, what was happening around the fundraising. She knows the right people. She knows that she's got the support, and uh, she's used the media very well. When check was slated for closure, we sold Save Check t-shirts to raise awareness and funds for her next venture, Janice Place. Right when the economy tanked, when we started doing this, right, I had reached out to some other organizations to see if they would like to partner with us on this. And the constant answer was, you'll never do it. You will never do that. That's been tried in the past. You'll never get it done. I really had a lot of doubts in myself at the very beginning, to tell you the truth. But when I realized how strong the team was and how determined the family was and how profound the need was, I was in. It took her a year to raise a second million dollars. It took her 20 minutes to raise the third million and 10 minutes to raise the full million. Tell us. 
came on board with a million dollars immediately. Fast, yes. The Norgard Foundation came on board with another million dollars. I like the yeses. The QA had money to, to put in as well. So we were getting yeses. We were really not getting any noes. She tries really hard at everything she does. She tells a good story. Uh, she makes a good case. She doesn't just talk the talk. She walks the walk. She shows up at stuff. She shows up at fundraisers. She makes phone calls. She thanks people. She does everything that needs to be done in a way that will make this successful. Oh, it never took a long to raise this amount of money. Took um, Janice out to a smaller community group, and the, the chairman said, you keep saying a million dollars. Are you really going to ask us for a million dollars? I said, well, if I don't, Janice will. <laughs> they went out, they came back and said, you got, Janice, you got your million dollars. Yeah, it's, uh, folks, we're talking about a very uh, special person. Got $1.3 million extra, plus in kind from other contractors. And we were getting stoves and refrigerators, sofas. <laughs> it was terrific. It cost with 1.6 million within three years from the time of the idea. She'd raised enough money, over $6 million. Wow. She sat down and drew pictures of how she wanted the house laid out, uh, the size of the house and everything. And uh, we gave him to the architect and he took what he saw there and put basically that same principle into the actual house. Janice was always there. Janice was involved in every aspect of that build. She poured concrete, she put her hands in the cement, um, she put up walls, she did plaster, she did painting. Yeah, there's pictures around of her driving the backhoe. We have the media room. I mean, it's purple because that was Janice's favorite color. She wanted Aboriginal art in there and she wanted to make sure that it was a, a place that welcomed the First Nations as well. And they agreed with all the sayings that she wanted around the house. And if you've been in the house, you'll see all those sayings that she has. And she Every blew aspect <laughs> blew up rock. Everybody on site essentially wanted to work on this project. Plumbers and electricians, plasters, all working at the same time in the house, and they never do that. Ron Tidman, he had a construction company, and Dura West came on board, and they decided that they would do it for free. And so, you know, the joke was that at a bit of a dollar, he actually lost the project because somebody else underbid him. And at one point, they had 47 all different areas that were working in at the house all at the same time, and it was just incredible. And it was built in practically no time. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of the top things I've ever done in my life, quite honestly. When we opened Janice's place, it was on Janice's 18th birthday. I think I need a nap now. They called me and asked me if I would like to paint her, her portrait to hang in Janice Place. So we went, I went to meet her and to sit down and talk with her and get to the feel of her a little bit, get to know who she was. And she was very proud of having been given a hockey shirt by the women's hockey team and they'd all signed it. So I said, well, why don't you put that on? I thought, well, this is her, the fundraiser. This is the hero. This is the, the person that is responsible for raising all this money and how she would be remembered as a public figure. On the eve of the grand opening of Janice Place at Victoria General Hospital, Janice Edroff received a very special birthday greeting from Premier Christy Clark Here's Vancouver this Island's best-known modern Victoria is celebrating a new Janice Citizen of the Year. Premier to meet the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. She got the Philanthropy Award for Victoria, Philanthropy for Vancouver, the International Philanthropy Award. She got the chance to meet all the Governor Generals of Canada. She was the young Youngest person in history to get the order of BC. Inducted into the Terry Fox Hall of Fame. She did meet Bob McGrath, Big Bird, and Elmo, Hilary Duff, and Taylor Swift. Janice Edroff joins us, who is going to be the last torchbearer. All this while she struggles with pain. Then she got the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. I said to her, you know, it must have been very exciting the meeting all these people and going on that show and she said, I would give it all up just to be a normal girl. And it really struck me.
you have a choice right now of living the rest of your life or you could do this and you could possibly lose the rest of your life type of thing. It's very a uh, scary situation. As if I had surgery, it would be the biggest surgery I've ever had in my life. Because they would have to remove my liver. So I had to have a liver transplant while having the surgery. And they would have to open up me from the front, the sides, the back. The risk of right now, because it's a ten, 1 in 10 chance of survival if I have surgery, and plus it's a spinal fluid sack and if they nick that I'm dead within a second because my brain will drop but if they can't then it's I'm gonna be not doing any type of chemo and I'm gonna be living the rest of my life doing whatever the hell I want and getting whatever I want and just living it to the max it's my first time being like knowing more and being able to have my own opinion properly is more harder and scarier and knowing that this could be it just makes me want to get to finish my bucket list and to enjoy life more and be more open and be more risky and challenging and Whatnot. There's a lot of places I want to travel, people I want to meet, different activities I want to do, people I want to kiss, stuff like that. Eventually I'll get there. To me, I'm always their mom, even though I'm trans, there's some still mom to you guys, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, I can do it here. I don't have to feel it. <laughs> yeah, for being slightly, somewhat uh, paralyzed in the area. Today is one month being on testosterone. Once you're on it, you're on it for life. They sometimes can up it, and then sometimes can give you something else that's stronger that can go for every other week. But it's been working great for me. The last three weeks, I've been doing my own shots and getting used to the side effects. I eat a lot of food and my voice is cracking, even now it's starting to crack. And then just the regular hormone stuff, and I now realize why guys are the way they are. We still say she. She was born a girl, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to really adjust that way. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, she's always my daughter. She will always be my daughter. And now she doesn't want to be recognized as a daughter. Yeah, it is like you're losing part of a child, you know, it's almost like a death in a sense, but... I think, like I said, I think a lot of them experience some grief and some loss when uh, they learn that the person that they thought they knew actually feels themselves to be quite someone else. That was their girl, you know, that was their penny girl, and I think definitely there's a feeling of loss of that life. I don't think Frankie sees it that way, but it definitely, I can see that that's where they're coming from a little bit. As a trans person, when I hear that story, it's so, it hurts, right? Because we're not lost, we're still here and actually thriving more. It hits my gut to hear that story, and also I think that where I've learned the most in terms of how that story can be shifted is from parents who have really had to grapple with, okay, I feel grief. It's a real feeling I have. I don't doubt that it's real for them. The other pieces, parents saying, I have expectations of who you'll be in the world. And you know what? There's still things that I hope for you in the world that you can still do, even if your gender has shifted from what we thought it was when you were born, right? When he was ready to make it fully public. I was, I was proud of the fact that he trusted us to tell his story. I think honestly we were hiding. We just, I didn't want to deal with it yet. And she's bringing it out into the public. It's, and you know, I, I battled my own demons with that because I said it's our fault because we put her in the media right from day one and that's what she's learned to use. It's a huge risk. You never know whether people are going to be accepting, uh, whether people are going to be supportive, and whether people are gonna go there with you. 
we only have to come out because we assume that somebody is cis first and then comes out as trans. That pressure is even already, I think, a constructed idea that we're putting on to trans folks and that requires them to have to come out at all. I also think that the story we're seeing in the media tends to fit within a pretty privileged view of what it means to be trans. We don't see a lot of conversation about ableism and disability in terms of how that fits with trans people's lives. And in reality, that isn't representative of so, so, so many trans people. Vancouver Island's Penny Girl has recently come out as transgender. Being such a well-known figure, Edroff says letting the public know is an important part of moving forward, even though it could create problems with fundraising. I don't want to hide anymore. I don't want to be in the closet. I don't want to feel trapped. And I said, I don't think you're going to find that it will affect your fundraising. I think, if anything, it makes you more courageous and brave to come out. She was going to go home and tell her parents. The end of the world didn't happen. happen you know, <laughs> it didn't happen the way we thought it might happen. And I say it did help. I think one of the turning points, like I was saying earlier, it was somebody that lives around here who's a teacher, and she had seen the media piece, and she said to me, she says, "You've got to thank Janice for what she just did. She actually made her, you know, her understand, and the kids that she has in her class." that had gone transgender and how you took it. She said, you're very, very brave and very wonderful people to do that. When high profile people transition, it, it, it creates space for others to feel more comfortable and more at ease in their own body. Frankie has really given youth space and a voice and a language. And it started making me thinking that it was a good thing. She actually, again in her life, what she chose, what she decided to do, is going to help other people. And parents, I mean, there are a lot of parents I know whose uh, kids are transitioning right now, and I think it's awesome. And they're, they're, they're well-loved and well-supported. And it's not just obviously a parent's responsibility to love a kid who's transitioning. It's our responsibility as a community to love that kid. I, again, I don't want to be too, too trite, but um, love is actually the answer. Can you imagine being Frankie and going, OK, what have I accomplished in life? And, you know, still pretty young, and go, oh yeah, eight million bucks to help other kids. It's a pretty good starting place, you know. I'm happy if I make my bed and cut the lawn. <laughs> Six months ago, I was at a hospital here for a suicide attempt because I was mad that I wasn't able to transition and that was my turning point. So that's when I was like, no, I gotta do this for me. Yeah, I'm in hospital for the reasons I am, but I am happier, I'm, I have more confidence and everybody respects my gender and everything, so I'm better off now.